Welcome, everybody. So this talk was inspired um, by a talk about a month ago um, that Fran gave called um, The Fathom Long Body. Um, a month ago, it seems so long ago, um, when the shops were still open and when um, it was only tier two in Oxford, where I live, and um, where you could, uh, you could go out and actually meet people outside. And, and, and many things seem different, even though um, uh, we were deep, deep into all this uh, story that we're in at the moment. Um, and it's striking, uh, I think, how difficult things have become um, and the, the risk of losing heart as the uh, 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 various restrictions go on and on and on. And in terms of the mind, it seems to me that it's, there's a very interesting process. Our normal life um, is constructed very, very deeply of a series of patterns by which we um, translate our aversions, our various, uh, uh, um, the, 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 the qualities of aversion, various difficulties, whether they're uh, more in the kind of boredom arena or the hate arena or the anger arena, we translate them into uh, um, uh, forms of greed, into forms of attachment that enable us to do all kinds of things, go out to a restaurant, go shopping, go, actually go anywhere. Um, and that pattern has been forcibly prevented by this crisis. And I think that's a very, it's a very interesting difficulty. I think a lot of the problem of this moment is um, the, the being thrown back into um, uh, aversion without the crutch of uh, greed. Now, from the point of view of um, enlightenment, neither greed nor aversion is any better than the other. They're both hindrances to the mind. But from the point of view of having a happy life and also of um, running much less risk of doing something wrong, um, greed is a heck of a lot better place to be than aversion. Um, although one has to say that with care. Um, and that's one of the issues that's around, the, 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 um, the, the, the problematic. And while in a certain sense, um, people who have become serious about a, an inner practice and who may even have gone on a strict practice and who may um, have spent time restricting the mind to enable mindfulness are in a much better position um, to try to cope with this um, than everybody around us. Nonetheless, the moment we come out of our practice, if we're on a strict practice, we're practicing all the time. Uh, in this context, we come out and we're among people who are not practicing. We're, among, we're thrown into the suffering, that particular suffering of um, the various aversions and the great difficulty of not, uh, of losing the habit, of losing the, 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 the reflex to go to the normal places of greed that we can normally go, we usually go. So it's very, very interesting because it's thrown us into um, uh, the need for greater mindfulness and greater um, watchfulness. Um, and that is uh, frankly healthy for our practice. And it, um, in a way it's been demonstrated, things within Samatha, not least these talks, um, have been a, a, a really a, a wonderful boon in this time. Now, um, <clears throat> thinking about not being able to go out, um, and at this time of year, um, immediately, of course, brings to mind the question, this is usually the time of year, you think of your summer holiday and you start booking it, um, or one worry, uh, wondering about what to do. And um, that takes me back to Fran's talk um, and the, the, the quotation 
which I'm going to put on the screen. Um, here we are, one second. Can you see this? Yeah, you can see the whole, there we go. There we are. This really rather wonderful quotation. I say, friend, that by traveling, one cannot know, see, or reach that end of the world where one is not born, does not grow old, die, does not pass away, and get reborn. Yet I say that without having reached the end of the world, there is no making an end of suffering. For it is in this fathom-long carcass, endowed with perception and mind, that I proclaim the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world, and the way leading to the cessation of the world. So I'll leave that up there for a moment. Um, so it's in the fathom long carcass. And that is about the only holiday we're going to get until um, these restrictions stop. So um, I was thinking about how we would take such a holiday. Um, interestingly, the word holiday, meaning holy day, might indeed even be appropriate in this context. Um, and what is it to travel through the fathom, fathom long carcass endowed with perception and mind? I'll come back to the main screen for a moment. Um, now, uh, this caused me to look up the word fathom. I don't know if people have, anyone's looked at what fathom means, but it's a very interesting word um, because as I looked at it, it seemed to me that it was, um, uh, it gave a word in English for what we're doing, what we're trying to do, we call meditation, um, that is much more natural, much more appropriate actually than uh, the word meditation. Meditation is a funny word. It seems to, it has a lot of cerebral mental quality to it. It isn't about the body and the mind, unless we understand it that way. But the, the word originally isn't, and it's quite a sort of abstract word. Fathom and fathoming is not. So what exactly is a fathom? Well, uh, does anyone know? A fathom is, uh, it's very difficult to do this on the screen. I've been practicing. I've been practicing. This is very, very difficult. It's this, but you've got to spread it out. Now you can't see. That is the stretch of your arms from side to side. And um, here is a very famous, let me share this again. A very famous example. Yes. Leonardo's famous example. So you can see the stretch of the fathom across. And you can see what's interesting about the fathom long carcass that if you, um, if you, that, that, that stretch is um, imagined, is understood as being the same length as the length of the body from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet um, in the square he's drawn there. So the, the idea of a fathom is, um, a natural length. Um, now, later on, it was defined as six foot, but it's a natural length, um, natural and specific to each of us. Our own fathom is that uh, length we ourselves stretch. And that makes it interestingly um, appropriate to our longest breath, which is again, our longest breath, not any kind of, um, uh, uh, objectively measured breath outside, but that which is the longest natural breath. So there's a way in which the fathom um, belongs with this pattern. Now, if you look at the meanings of the word fathom, uh, it's even more interesting. 
So the, 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 the word as a, as a verb, fathoming, to fathom, initially meant something that is now an obsolete meaning, but it's really a wonderful meaning and an important one for us. Um, it means to put those two arms together, to embrace. And um, uh, so to fathom someone is to embrace them. And that quality is, again, very appropriate in our practice to this, which is the embrace when we put our hands together so that the longest breath, which is, as it were, where the hands end, is actually uh, embraced within the fathom of our body's length as it folds around. Um, and actually, as we sit and begin to practice, if there is that quality of embracing, um, then uh, the basis, really powerful basis of loving kindness is, is present. You could say that's almost uh, all you need as the basis of loving kindness. Now, all of that's a very natural set of postures. Um, but then the next meaning of fathoming is the idea of fathoming something out, measuring it. Um, and in fact, the word fathom becomes a measure, the six foot measure, and a measure particularly of depth, the depth of the sea. So if you think of um, uh, meditation as setting out in a little boat across the ocean of the mind, um, uh, in the uh, imagery of fathoming, it is also a measure of the depth of the mind. Um, now, that quality of measuring or investigating, exploring, um, adds the mental side in what the Buddha says, the um, fathom long carcass, that's about the body and its mind and perceptions. That's about the mind or the mental qualities that together make the being, body and mind. Um, so the quality, the combination of uh, Rupa and Nama, okay, to share again. Rupa meaning form, appearance, figure, matter, materiality, body, an object of sense experience, the objective side of anything we experience. Nama, naming, the name we put on it, mentality, the immaterial factors that are involved. And the two together, Nama Rupa, what form, what create the individual or the individual being, that which is made up of mentality and materiality, sometimes translated as name and form. Now, um, it's very interesting this because we never actually experience any object in the world except through um, our own uh, quality of perception. So that any, all objects exist as already Nama and Rupa, the object and the mind. And um, we ourselves exist as that. So the question of fathoming uh, the end of the world is a question of taking that posture and going in depth with these two factors in play, the, the form and the mental um, quality, the feeling, the mental feeling. So what I was going to propose is that we try to practice with that um, uh, aim of, um, of being awake, alive to the two qualities in everything we do. So as we begin counting, one thing is the precision of the count, um, hearing or seeing the count, but the other is to, to, to be awake to the nama of that form, the mental quality. And the moment that's clear, change 
to that mental quality in the following, the feeling. The moment that feeling in the following becomes sharp, uh, see if there is a more subtle nama in relation to that um, feeling of the breath and change to the touching. And again, when the touching is sharp, is there something, is there a, um, a brightness? Is there a, um, uh, uh, something more subtle, a, a more peaceful quality in relation to the touching that is not simply the material um, uh, 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 feeling of the uh, breath on the tip of the nose or the upper lip, but is something more, um, uh, a, a quality, a more integrated quality of, of mind, of nama, then shift to that. And then within the, uh, the settling, um, once it's settled and there is something, a feeling in the settling, can one make it more subtle, um, go more to its energy and less to the thinky side, less to Vipitaka and Vichara, more towards the, uh, the PT Sukha side? And then can one go more towards the contentment rather than any sense of energization, then can one go more to a sense of equanimity in the uh, shortest of settling? And then if you do want to practice the Arupa jhanas, very interesting conundrum. How do we fathom the unfathomable? Fathomless, unmeasurable by definition unmeasurable space, unmeasurable consciousness. And then how do we fathom nothing? And finally, how do we fathom that when you neither fathom nor fathom, nor not fathom, when there's no, yet in all those points, there is still the fathom long carcass, and there is still its mind and perceptions. So there's a very interesting, um, um, almost, uh, it's almost like a kind of contradictory koan, in the, the Zen they would say a kind of koan, in the quality of um, uh, the question there, because the body is still there and the mind is still there, and yet it is part of within something so much bigger or not at all. And interestingly, in the last one, um, if there's anything there, then it's coming from um, very deep karmic reflexes of um, uh, 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 patterns, very deep in the mind. The same problematic patterns of, but at a much more subtle level, of um, greed and aversion that are um, the current problem outside the practice in how we deal with um, this particular uh, COVID problematic. And so there's a very interesting, the very deepest place in the practice, a very interesting um, possible um, intimation of some of the drives that are um, so problematic, not just in us personally, each of us personally, but around, in the people around us, in the space around us, um, in, uh, in, in, in those people who can't help themselves but break the rules and all the rest of it. Um, so a very, very interesting, can we fathom um, a, little bit of, a little bit of that? So I thought, that's what we do, and then perhaps talk about it a bit more afterwards. So, shall we practice? I won't um, give instructions, because what I'd like people to do is to try um, uh, to, to explore the, the business of how you find the, men, the nama in the rupa. So the moment there is a sense of rupa, can you see the mental um, can, you, can you see the quality 
the feeling of mind and shift to it. And that means if you shift, you don't have to wait for the end of a breath. You can shift in the middle of a breath. You can shift on the in-breath or on the out-breath. It doesn't matter. Just go deeper more into, the, into the more subtle between Nama and Rupa at whatever point you want. And go as far as you want in the practice, go to, uh, into, uh, into the settling or into the arupas, whatever you wish. Um, and at the end, I'll uh, 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 give an instruction to return to the longest of settling and then uh, out of the practice. Um, so to pick you up wherever you are and we'll come back um, slowly. Okay, I'll put on a, um, an image, I'll put on a rupa. There we are. Turn to the ordinary breath and slowly finish the practice. So before um, we um, have a conversation, just thought the idea of fathoming, it doesn't translate bhavana, um, the Pali term that we use for, that is really used for uh, what we call meditation. Bhavana means um, cultivation, looking after something, bringing it into being. Fathoming really uh, 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 emphasizes three things that we do normally in our practice. The first is that question of the embrace of, of loving kindness, a touch of loving kindness. And then um, being mindful of the Nama Rupa quality, mindfulness and investigating its depth. So mindfulness and Dhamma Vichaya, investigation. Um, and those are the first two of the list of um, Bojangas, of uh, the qualities of awakening. Um, and I think that means that fathoming is a kind of way of setting up the process that leads on towards um, equanimity in that, in that route. But anyway, if anyone has some thoughts, you're very welcome. Oh, when we do practice, I wrote some, wrote something out. So I'll just read what it says. The truth is that which is. The truth is not what you want it to be. Understand there is truth in the lies and lies in the truth. Try not to think of try not to think of things as right or wrong. It is a flexible path choosing what suits while avoiding what negates. Once you think you have the truth, it shuts the mind off. New information cannot get in. Realize the truth from a multitude of resources. That's really what kind of came up for this fathoming for me. Um, I'm not really sure of it, Rob. I'm not really sure of uh, that was the intention, but... Uh... Interesting. Interesting. So, it can, um, to summarise that, in a way, truth, the question of truth as not something that limits but opens is what you're talking about. I think, that's, yeah. I think that is right. Because you can never... Uh, uh, particularly, it's related to this subjective thing. Um, the fathom is... It's your... It's not a fixed length um it's your length your spread of arms your body your longest breath and all the other breaths of course are in fact are related to your longest breath they're yours and so um and they change with the subtlety of the mind just as the body can sometimes feel immensely huge in the practice or very small um and so it's exactly that flexibility of um, going more subtle, going more deep. Interesting to see it with truth. Thank you. Okay, Simon. 
Yes, um, thank you very much, Ash. Um, really um, interesting talk. Um, what it reminded me of initially is um, something which, um, I don't know if you know um, the writings and the thoughts of Ajahn Sachito in the Thai forest tradition. Um, I live about three miles away from him, so I get to see quite a lot of it, or did before lockdown. <laughs> And for the last 10 years, certainly since he published this little book, um, Kama and the End of Kama, um, he's been talking a lot about fathoming. And he's been saying he, he uses um, his own little private translation of Yoniso Manasikara as fathoming attention mm. um, in the sense of during meditation or during um, any contemplative activity, just the, the idea of like, what's this, what's this, what's this? Um, almost like sometimes can we get to the bottom of it, but kind of, you know, where does it go to? What, what's its extent? So just, just kind of to say that that kind of linked up very nicely for me with, um, with, his, with his teachings. Oh, wonderful. I, didn't, I, I just don't, did, didn't know that. That's, that's fantastic. Very interesting. And I do, and in, in his account, it's, it's quite similar. Uh, the... the the question of mindfulness, you, you've got to have a, some grasp of the thing you're looking at, but then that question, what is it? Which is the investigation side. So it's again, the first two of the, of the Bojangas. Yeah, it reminded me that some of the descriptions of stream entry, the stream entry sees Dhamma, but also plunges into, if you like, fathoms right. Dhamma. Um, which I, I quite like, like the idea of plunging into Dhamma, fathoming it. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the Yoniso Manasikara, yeah, I sometimes translate that as probing attention, but Yoniso is actually from the womb, wh where, things, ar how f where mm -hmm. things arise from, so to speak. But, yeah. mm. I don't know whether you've seen the chat that's come up as a question that just appeared, I think, from Vijay as to what is the... The Pali word for fathom, if it's in one of the suttas, um, uh, it, it must have, you know, that sutta, that quote you gave us at the beginning, the word is used there, isn't it? Um, I'm going to defer to Peter on this. <laughs> yeah, I think he's right, just... <laughs> looking it up. I think actually uh, Fran did mention it in her talk, you know, but I can't remember Can the I... detail now. <laughs> it's actually, I think actually in that context, it's a kind of loose translation. It just means kind of, mm, you know, this, this kind of longish bod body, something like that. And it's just rather a nice translation. What mm. I can't remember is where I would find that plunging into <laughs> verb. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. The idea of um, a stream enterer very literally. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Take me a while to find it. <laughs> I can see. Hello, Diana. Just unmute if you haven't already. Yep. Hello, yes, and uh, thank you very much, Yash. So I really enjoyed the talk um, and the, 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 what pe comments people have made afterwards. I mean, Matthew talking about truth, it seemed it sort of brought in a kind of Christian feel almost, you know, the truth and the way. Um, and the word fathom, to me, also brings up the idea of as above, so below, um, and sort of going to fathoms of the ocean. You know, you go down fathom deep into the ocean, deeper and deeper, and exploring those depths, and also up into the boundless sky. So, you know, in meditation, I suppose, for me, um, it's when you go into the settling. I mean, I'm old school, so I don't do the controlling the breath in the settling. I, let, I use the settling to let go of control. So, this, you know, that, that time can be the, the going into the boundless, if you like, um, and the opening up to ex deep exploration, um, which will happen, all the things that Yash mentioned, you know, the equanimity, the contentment, the joy, and so on, those will arise naturally, not something we can control, you know, but they will arise naturally with the letting go and the um, longer sits as well. I find that, you know, the subtlety, the levels of subtlety, if you sit for longer than 30 minutes, you know, if you go for an hour or longer, then naturally you get into more and more subtle levels. 
Um, yeah, so thank you again, Yash. That was very interesting. Thank you, Diana. The question is if um, going on a brief holiday of this kind every day, a travel as far as we can to the end of the world, um, we can come back with heart for the rest of all this. Because it'll be a while to get through it, and it goes on and on, um, and it's really important to bring heart back, not just for ourselves, for everybody. Mm. Yes, that's right. I just came about here uh, plunging into, it's in the Ambata Sutta. All right, yeah. What, what reference is that? The, uh, uh, the third of the uh, Diganikaya, the Ambata Sutta. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, where um, some ascetic or uh, Brahmin plunges into a wilderness region carrying his stuff on a shoulder pole. Mm. It's, uh, I guess it will be the Anabi Sam Unamano. Mm. Can't quite find it. But another plunging is a fathom has come to my mind. The Tathagata is described as deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom, as is the great ocean. Mm. Yep. <laughs> While you're pondering that, maybe I could take a chance to um, just um, offer some some thoughts as well. Um, it was interesting for me how this talk linked up with the previous one from Gwil and the previous one from that, from, from Fran, actually, and that there was almost a continuity and it was really, really good to get that feeling because, um, first of all, Gwil actually talked about the axes of the body and he did use the same image that... Uh, you used um, to show the extent of um, a fathom. And, and, um, and actually, Gwil gave us a practice in which we became very conscious of that, that extent, you know, in different directions. And, uh, and, it, and it focused very much on the body and, and the stability and the sort of balance that, that comes about through being aware of one's extent in a physical sense. And then... Uh, your talk took that, um, picked up almost from that and, 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 and focused more on the distinction between the physical sense and, 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 and the mental sense. I suppose we're quite used to that, you know, sort of bodily and mental, but it was very useful to have a more refined focus on it in, in this practice um, and, and seeing the distinction and almost as, as Diana indicated, sort of letting go more and more into uh, rupa <laughs> or mind. Um, uh, and of course, Fran's talk made it very clear that it's only within your body. I think the word fathomless and was it fathom long? Um, fathom long. <laughs> was, was it fathom long or fathom yeah. less? Fathom <laughs> long. long. <laughs> difference, isn't it? Um, and, uh, but it's within this, you know, uh, fathom long, which is all the extents as well, that, that only there will you find your heart, your truth, your, you know, um, it, it's within yourself. It's not necessarily out there to be, to be kind of grasped at, but to be discovered inside. So um, I think that's what I'd like to, um, to, you know, to, to respond with those thoughts of how, you know, the accumulation <laughs> of this theme is very, very helpful. Okay. And I can see Simon, I think. Yeah. Um, just Sorry, I, I don't know how to use the chat function on here, but the, um, the Pali word for fathom, I believe, is Bhyama. And there's um, also, uh, uh, there's something to do with uh, Bhyama Pabha, which is the idea of the Buddha's kind of light around him extends. Again, you can't do it on screen, but it extends to the, the length of both arms stretched out. I've seen that somewhere. Mm. 
So the, the kind of radiant aura around the Buddha is, is, is of, of that dimension in some descriptions, but I think it's Bhyama. Mm. Interesting. So this word, fathom, <laughs> as I, I intimated without any knowledge it was going to be, it's going to be um, a wonderful area to investigate, isn't it? In all these different aspects. Yes, um, no, enormously interesting. Um, and the whole idea of uh, a holiday. Um, I, I wonder if you um, could say a little bit more about um, that, that embrace and in terms of in, uh, intention. You know, because the striking thing, you know, practicing in such a way as a group after a talk is that is just the those conditions mm. that are there. So I, I wonder if you could say a tiny bit more about intention and how how we might kind of work that with the suffering that is around us and in us and... Mm. Well, it, actually, one thing that comes to mind is quite uh, interesting, actually. I'm thinking about um, the weird Arupa quality of Zoom in this context, um, uh, which we sort of marked with, you know, a, a chant from America, nonetheless, being at this very moment. And, you know, it's sort of easy to, it's all, we can rationalize it. That's how Zoom works, but it's magical. Um, and it's very in interesting. I couldn't go to Gwil's talk. So I can't remember why, but I couldn't go. So I didn't hear it, although I did see the image that advertised it, which was the one I'd already chosen. Mm. So that was the only connection I had with that talk. But clearly there's a link going on of some kind, which is not about individual intention exactly, but there is um, some kind of spirit of collective intention, which is not unconnected to the practice base that's, in, um, that's going on here. It's, it's quite striking, quite interesting. And um, there is a deep collective need, if not intention, among us, but beyond that, for um, finding a way um, to be really creative in a proper Dhamma way in this very difficult time. So those things are connected, actually, even in these talks and, um, and across time and space in a very strange way, because after all, unlike all our previous practice, we are not in each other's presence in the normal way. Um, so I think that's really uh, um, mysterious intriguing to me um, um, uh, and, and, and really interesting that the, the practice can go deep, for example. I mean, how weird. It, it, and yet it's not, it, it, it is um, true. <laughs> I mean, I can, at least I'm in my experience, the practice is, goes deep in these, in contexts where it's led in a group like this. Um, and that's also very interesting. Um, I, I, I think the other thing, because with meta, we, we, we perhaps try too hard. The thing about just the embrace in terms of the, the breadth, the putting the, the hands where they should go, and that is, red, it's sort of setting up. If we were, if, uh, uh, you know, it's rather a wonderful way of setting up the practice. And it's an embrace that is about ourselves, but... Um, on that basis, um, universal, but from the from the single from the little experience, that just the touch of it to universal loving kindness, is really only a matter of sort of degree. Um, uh, what should we intensity of practice or whatever? But actually, it's not so, it's not so great. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, and I, I mean, I just thought that was a wonderfully simple way of, um, of, of making, as it were, intention 
manifest yeah. just by that action of the posture. Yeah. Uh, and that idea of encompassing Nama and Rupa. It, you know, yeah. And it's interesting because it's without the, the thing is it's with, it is it's um, it's integrated because it is both Nama and Rupa, but it's not naming it. When I mean I, I think it's it maybe just it's a Western, but we like to name we 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 put too much emphasis on the kind of labelling side uh, when we think about intention. But it is but if you can manifest it in the body, it's just so much more powerful. Hi. Hi. So um, I just wanted to ask you what you thought about a couple of things. The bad and long body reminds me of, is it the Dhamma Kaya? Is it the body of Dhamma that one gets closer and closer to? Um, you, when you were talking about doing our practice, um, I think you were saying, look at if there's still the presence of greed, hate, or um, well, you can spot greed and hate even more easily, but I was thinking that we could, re you know, reverse that and see the, the positive qualities that, that are there as opposed to the negative. So the product of, of our karma, um, of our habits, not only negative, but mm -hmm. also the fruit of the positive ones, especially, you know, if you've hopefully been practicing a long time. So focusing more on the positive karma that might be present. So um, yeah, the question is, is that is that possible as well to reflect in that way? And that the, the Dhammakaya is very like the fathom long body and it's like the 32 mark, one of 32 marks of the, um, the span of the arms equal to the height of the body, um, which is very, very, very clear. And then you can do that test and you can see that usually that span is the same as, as your height. Um, that's what I wanted to mention. <laughs> I, I, this really interesting what you say about the Dhammakaya. So now, um, in, the, in the tradition that develops beyond Theravada, it's not really in Theravada explicitly, but they have three or possibly even four Kayas. There's the Rupa Kaya, but that's not... Uh, that's earlier, but then they talk of the Nirmanakaya, which is um, the, um, the manifestation body, and that's actually thought of as our ordinary body. It happens to be a manifestation. The Sambhogakaya, which is really interesting, the body of bliss, which is, I think, very connected with jhana, very connected with the, 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 the qualities that bring a kind of um, immense happiness and, and settledness. And then the Dhammakaya, which is the, the, the teaching, the body of the teaching of the Dhamma itself, but as you said, but is, is more connected in, you were you're kind of implying, and I think, I'm sure that's right, with the Arupa qualities, the qualities of, of uh, um, uh, limitless and um, um, uh, almost hard to fathom. And um, it seems to me that there's, there's a lot in that, actually. Um, it's a sort of development but they do t say, uh, instead of Nama Rupa, they can say Nama Kaya. So they do, the Kaya thing, the body thing, is already wrapped up in, in that question. Um, and on the other point you made, I'm sure you're right, you can also see the positive. <laughs> <laughs> on the, and it's, that's also interesting. If, you're, if, if you want to... Cre if you want to create the better, then you see the positive. If you want to purify, <laughs> you see the other side. So, it, it, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, working as a, a GP, um, I've been very interested how, how um, many of my patients with the most intractable and long-standing um, mental and, and social problems have actually made considerable strides through this time um, and often kind of breakthroughs in fact and it's very very interesting kind of quite why that has happened um, and there is something to do with um, I mean various thoughts have come but there's something almost the kind of 
physical, the external landscape has changed and that somehow changes the internal landscape, um, whatever we have. But also because, as you said, we're kind of separated from a lot of our normal um, ways of coping, we're thrown back on ourselves much more. We're, we're kind of thrown back on our own resources um, much more. Um, and in fact, that is a, a tremendous opportunity, as you said. I mean, it, it, it helps to highlight particular things, maybe have been in the background, but not really been quite so apparent. Um, and that does leave us with a chance to actually do something about them, to kind of, maybe to kind of turn things um, around. Um, and it's very um, interesting. And I think also it, it sort of holds up a kind of mirror almost when one spends more time on one's own, um, as lots of people have had to, then, then it does, um, show us something about ourselves. Um, and I was very interested what you said about embracing, because, I mean, the fascinating thing is, it's the one thing in one sense we can't do, mm -hmm. We're completely uh, cut off from actually physically embracing, but it's an opportunity to find other ways of embracing individuals when we meet them with our heart or mind but um very interesting quite how you can do that and actually become almost more sensitive to people um, and what the appropriate response may be um, so anyway um, some some thoughts sparked off by your by your talk no thank you i think that's uh, great that's wonderful um i think it what is it's um you know Nothing, nothing has been so good for Samata for a long time as COVID. That's a terrible thing to say. But it's, but it's kind of true in the point, in the sense that you've put it. It has, and after all, most of us would not have had the opportunity to go into a hermitage. Um, and yet in a kind of way, it's been offered to us. Um, and of course, people, if people are locked up in a hermitage without wanting to be there, that's very, very difficult. But you're entirely right about about the challenges and 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 also about the challenge to embrace um, to to find loving kindness in a certain sense without the attachments necessarily that might go with embracing. I mean, almost a more pure form. Um, hello there, Yash. I was struck by the first breath that we did in the longest of counting. Um, I was reminded of Nye Booman's teaching about, that he said, oh, you know, if you, the longest of counting done co correctly in it lies the possibility of, you know, the answer, freedom or whatever, because it struck me that for also Scorpio is a water sign. I like deep, dark, dank, watery places. <laughs> and the first breath thought, oh yes, that nice sense of, we immediately go plunge straight into the depths of our body with taking our rupa with us in the terms of numbers and a thought, but it's immediately depersonalized de 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 because it's a number. It's not I am counting. It's actually very efficacious medicine. And, and it's almost like the very first breath we do in the practice is it's sort of like a blueprint for the rest of the practice. And I was thinking about then when you're talking about it in terms of the picture of the fathom long body, and it's almost as though from then onwards, how often do we find our posture changes as we practice and often straightens up or it relaxes and then straightens up. And so it's almost like within that there's bodies and as you've all talked about dhamma bodies that actually the fathom long body changes and it, it's it, in these dhamma talks it extends to america across the world wherever we are it, it extends from wherever i am and and wherever you are all are in all your places it sort of it sort of it does unite us in that sort of sense of a fathom long body the other thing i would say is that there's a group of us 
um, has been studying the Dhammasangini for, um, a, 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 for a while now. And funnily enough, last week, we, would, we looked in, de in, in depth at greed, hate, and delusion and what the actual words were. And I found it made absolute sense what you first started with, how practical greed is actually, that in society, greed is tends to be, I suppose, would it be true to say that it could be less harmful than carrying hate around in the world? And interestingly, that's reflected in the text because it's like one of us counted at the last week, there's over 80 descriptions for greed, whereas the paragraphs for hate and delusion are just sensible little paragraphs that, and there are other paragraphs that you can get added to it so it but it's a, a sensible sort of way of describing them whereas the greed isn't almost sensible because it's so poetic the way all these <laughs> expressions of how we can uh, you know we you know we i'm not going to try and remember all the words but i just uh, but it just made sense to me how it's quite we have to work with it in the world. And then there's paragraphs on working with it in loosening it, which is what we're doing when we practice. And I just, uh, I just thought I'd say that because it made sense of why we all said, why are there so many expressions for greed? And of course, it's very quite practical. It's sort of saying something about it, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's, it's very interesting. You say that you know, there's a, there's a ooh, something's ri ringing, but there's a there's a full um, a, a sort of um, it's kind of the official line is that none of these are any better than the others. Like, they're all dreadful, um, but but <laughs> there is this. Uh, the fact is <laughs> that one will cause less harm. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways than than the other and that really is quite important <laughs> it's quite interesting that there that in a certain then that's reflected also in the in in the text but i also agree so much that i do think that that first i mean it's all there and in that first breath and um um and it's just that our mind isn't bright enough at that moment to go all the way <laughs> Yeah, that's why we need to do another one. <laughs> Just wanted to say, um, following on from what Rosie, Rosie jogged my memory. Um, years ago, I remember in, in some, we used to talk about uh, greed being more of a Samatha thing and hate being more of a Vipassana um, and the, the danger with, you know, and... and they used to say that hate or aversion can lead to is insight, but insight, what do they call it? Dry insight without the compassion is, you know, is no good either. I mean, it all needs balancing basically, doesn't it? So, you know, if you're a hate type, you might have a lot more insight, but without the heart, without the compassion, it's it, that's not beneficial either so you know it's always about the balancing um of those things yeah just going back to what we were saying earlier um there's another word for embrace acceptance sorry you uh, the, uh, uh, I, I missed the it didn't okay. quite hear that okay there's another word for embrace acceptance acceptance Acceptance. Well, um, that's interesting. Um, when it, that might be so, I could see that. In when the, the word fathom, but that's where I got to embrace from. One of the meanings. The, uh, it's an obsolete meaning now, but it, it, it's simply you know that you, you you take the fathom and you encircle, you embrace with it. So that is really more, that's, and I think that's used as really as a physical embrace. But of course, because the idea of fathoming is then used to think about, to, 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 to meaning thought or going, um, uh, uh, working something out, going, fathoming out the depth of something, um, that's got a, a, a kind of intimation of embracing in the physical way. Um, so that's more than acceptance. It is actually a welcoming. Mm. 
There's a, a and and it's really interesting that the idea you can't really understand something. So it's like the stream enterer in Ray Peter was talking. You've really got to get into that stream and welcome the water, um, uh, in in that sense. And 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 that a kind of warmth, a touch of warmth mm. in understanding, which is interesting because then it touches against the kind of hate. In so it's the opposite of the hate side. With 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 insight as it were it's got it balances we balance that just in the the greed versus hate bit i remember it being said that um the uh, comparing the two the, on the on the plus side of hate there's more incentive to get rid of it um <laughs> which i think <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I think Peter's put up a chat there um, about, do you want to say what it is, Peter, then everyone can hear it. They might not see the chat. You're muted, Peter. Peter. Okay. Greed, this is a subtle which says, greed is a lesser fault, but fades slowly. Hate is a greater fault, but fades more quickly. Delusion is a great fault and fades slowly. <laughs> <laughs> now, I th I, the, the quick and the slow, I'm not quite sure it means in the immediate present, yeah. perhaps. But um, if you look at the, 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 the level, noble persons and what fetters they get rid of, um, you can get rid of uh, hatred by the level of a, of a, a non-returner. But the, even the non-returner has still subtle attachment to... Uh, the, the jhanas and the formless levels. <laughs> anyway. But also, I think at the more everyday level, hate, you know, you get little bumps of hatred, but delusion is a bit, um, greed is a bit more pervasive, as is delusion. Thank you. All this talk of um, greed and hate, I would like to know, where does fear come in? Is that delusion or is that some sort of hate because fear talking about plunging into the depths etc etc seems to me that fear is a big is a big uh, well you know what's it to doing that it's a big um, mm. non, non. I, I do think it's a form of aversion but it's obviously not um fired up in the same way as i mean hate is uh, is only one of a whole number that fit under aversion. I would have thought fear is un, would be would count as a form of aversion, but it goes also to doubt and to sort of slips it sort of un, set, undermines self in a way that hate might enforce a sense of self on some level. Just to say um, on the fear in the Mahasamaya Sutta, it's the, very, the right at the very end of this beautiful Sutta with all, <coughs> you know, raging from the all different levels of beings, <clears throat> right at the very end, um, when uh, Mara is defeated, it's the phrases, without fear, can't remember, they rejoiced. But so fear, I think, comes with us the whole way. Abaya, I think is, I don't know what the Pali, what they say. Oh, it's the Pali scholar, Sorry? Uh, abaya is fearlessness. Be fearless. Yeah, exactly, fearless. without fear. Yeah. Right at the end, without fear, they rejoice. So I think fear... You know, even the Buddha on the night of his enlightenment, didn't he? He had the fear. He had that fear as well as the, from the armies of um, assaulting him. I, th I think fear is a really interesting one. I also think fear is countered by courage and courage from heart, which is, goes back to the beginning of the talk, bringing heart back. Mm. Yeah, that's it. I did um, want to say that um, the image that we had of the person sitting with, uh, it's a very simple one that you showed a line drawing that, but, uh, uh, of the person sitting in the posture and it, and it reminded me and made me feel the, the importance of the, not a correct posture, but postures generally. In fact, we've had a few references to this you know, about uh, creating in the body as a kind of preparation or setting up. But when when you combined the um, 
the thought or the feeling of embracing. So the sitting posture with the hands on the, on the lap was um, not just uh, a sort of convention, but a means of embracing somehow and having a good heart, you know, having um, that sense of embracing in terms of metta or a, a positive feeling of some kind. So attaching that feeling to the posture sets it up and just a little touch there which came out through what you said which I hadn't connected before so I think you know just a subtle kind of awareness in the posture can make quite a big difference to the to the mental state I mean, and so um, it, it, it all fits together <laughs> one one if you shifted from say uh, thinking of the posture not in terms exactly of uh, loving kindness but more of dana generosity yeah then it it the very very interesting that that when they describe dana in the um in the commentaries there are three levels of dana the first is um material things fair enough mm. the third one the last is dharma the giving of dhamma mm. you can understand but the middle one is the giving of fearlessness, abhaya dharma, and it's a, a really a, an amazing um, uh, call to us at this moment. I mean, that is a, that that you can see how that is the that's an extraordinary act of generosity. If one could give that to any one person in this time when there's so much fear around, mm -hmm. and it's in, in in one could see that posture as a kind of establishment of that. Mm -hmm for oneself yeah. um, because in the end of course uh, you have to give that to yourself in order to go the whole way in the practice mm -hmm. I mean it has to be fearless mm -hmm. in the end and so that's I think that the, that, that quality is really important it's really interesting and it does go with dharma mm -hmm. I've always thought that was really deep somehow yeah. thank you I think Matthew's waving yeah, just on this point of fear, you do not need fear to protect yourself because if you literally had no fear whatsoever, you'd have no fear of consequence. Therefore, you just go about there and just do whatever and say whatever without any care in the world. Do you not need fear to kind of think, well, actually, if I go and do that thing, as a consequence to me, I don't want to face that consequence. Therefore, I want to, you know, do you, know, do you know, kind of see what I'm trying to say? But you're talking about something that's not really being afraid of, but almost a wisdom, a kind of being, b being shy in your heart of harming someone. So, or of harming yourself. So that's not fear in being afraid. In fact, there's quite a lot of courage in, in that, actually. Um, although you, I, I mean, you're not wrong to say that we sometimes use the English word fear to blur between those two um, uh, qualities. Uh, but you're quite in the in the in the way you are talking about fear. Um, that you know, then it's complicated because we're confusing the words. But your way of talking is it's a really important quality. Um, uh, you know, the re regard for consequences and yeah. and and not wanting oneself to be sullied by doing something bad. Is that Felicity waving? Hello, Felicity. Oh, Hello. it isn't. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, her name's on the video. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's not Felicity, so... <laughs> but uh, I'm Duncan. But, so, uh, it seems to me that there's a difference between hatred and the, greed, the various forms of greed, and so it seems to me that almost all the forms of greed or indeed fear, as we've just been discussing, are accentuations, imbalances of necessary appetites and necessary sensations. Whereas it's hard to think of a, a, a positive a need for any kind of hatred. And that seems to me to be a sort of... I don't know how this comes out in the teachings, but it seems to me to be rather radical difference between hatred and the other problems that we discuss. Well, I suppose it's why it's the, uh, in the terms that, and that's sort of Peter cited, it's why it's the greater um, uh, uh, problem as it were, 
On the other hand, the problem with greed is that once you're attached and you don't get the thing, um, you plunge into hate or aversion. And so in, in thinking of our time now, if the, if the props for going to normal, the normal props of, of, of sense desire or attachment are taken away, um, the, the, the risk is greater aversion. Um, and that obviously is something that we, is really important to fight against, um, just socially. Well, it was really to ask a slightly different thing about fathoming. I found the whole talk really fascinating. But to, to me, fathoming has sort of intrinsic content. A lot of what we've talked about has been about watery things and about going down into depths and so on. And for me, father, it's very interesting because fathoming is a measure of, of depth into water, into places that you can't see. It's not a measure of distance, uh, of horizontal distance or vertical distance where you can but of going down into water. And I don't know whether that's a curiosity of English as a sort of coastal language, if you like, um, or whether that's intrinsic to the notion. But it, it, I just wondered what you thought about that, Yash. I think it makes it so much more appropriate. <laughs> I mean, if we could see it, we <laughs> probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> How would you like to end the meeting, Yash? Well, would anyone like to chant a blessing? I do the Bojangas to finish it. Bojangas at his anchor to the man and which I owed at a weary and pity passadi bojanga jatata pare sama dupe ka bojanga sate te sapata sena Munina samata kata bhaveta bhuti kata samvandhanti apenaya devanaya chapodiya etena sacha vajena so chite ho tu sabada Sadhu. 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 Sadh